Morning. Morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming along to, to the witnesses as well. Uh, can I just welcome you to the 20th meeting of the Social Security Committee? Can I remind everyone to turn off their mobile phones, please, as it does interfere with the sound system? Uh, agenda item one is decision in taking business in private. Is it agreed that we take agenda item four in private, committee? Yep. Thank you very much. <coughs> agenda item two is a further evidence, continuation of an evidence of the Social Security Committee at stage one. We have two panels of witnesses today. And our uh, first panel, can I welcome Heather Noller, a uh, Policy and Parliamentary Officer, Carers Trust Scotland, and Amy Woodhouse, Head of Policy, Children in Scotland. Welcome and thank you very much for coming along at an early hour. Thank you. Uh, and I'll start off with the first question, which is a general question, and then committee members will, will follow on from there. Uh, in earlier evidence sessions, we have asked our witnesses for their views on the principles and the proposed charter. Uh, can I ask the witnesses, what are your views and in what ways do you see the principles and the charter influencing the organisation culture of the new Social Security Agency? I'll start off. Heather? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think in line with other organisations that you've heard evidence from, we really welcome the fact that the principles and the charter are on the, the face of the bill and in primary legislation. That's going to be the major thing that, that causes a, a kind of cultural and organisational change, particularly the principles around human rights um, and as social security as an investment in people of Scotland, that's, that's a real positive step, I think. It's going to be very useful for, for driving a cultural change in, in how social security is seen. Yeah, equally, I'm very supportive and I think it's um, really welcome that the principles are set out right at the top. It's the first thing that you see um, and I think we would be supportive of that to, to be um, maintained. Um, I think the emphasis on human rights is very important. Um, if there's opportunity to emphasise an extension to child rights, that would be very welcome from our perspective. Um, dignity is equally very important, and we're really pleased to see that in there and like to see that threaded throughout the rest of the bill where appropriate. Um, the one area where I think there's a potential gap that we would be keen to address is in the principles, is in recognising the purpose of Social Security as addressing poverty and inequalities, and we would suggest that an additional principle was put in relating to that. Uh, thank you. I think I noticed that on your uh, written submission. When we talk about the culture, obviously, uh, would you say that perhaps uh, various agencies, once the principles are agreed, uh, various agencies perhaps would need training in regards to the principles that are there on the bill? would certainly welcome that, and I'm sure that that would be a good idea. Um, I think more detail in the charter as well might help with that, too, to understand how the principles could get put into practice and what that actually means in terms of um, the system and how it works and operates. Obviously, the most obvious way in which it interfaces is in, is in human relationships um, and certainly how um, positive relationships can be at the heart of the system, I think, is an, is an area that training is always is welcome and certainly would encourage that um, and, and an emphasis on relationships within the charter and, and the implementation process. Thank you, Heather. Did you want to give an update? Just, just to reiterate, really, we would always welcome training for, for agencies, particularly as we're going to have <laughs> these kind of two different systems working alongside each other. A lot of carers um, will still be receiving the reserve benefits mm. or supporting people who are receiving reserve benefits. So making sure that there's understanding of how the systems are interacting will be very beneficial. And uh, yes, in terms of positive relationships and needing to, to reiterate the difference that a, a Scottish social security system is going to bring. A lot of people are obviously quite um, reticent about how the changes are going to happen because they've had quite negative experiences with the current system. So that's going to be really important to, to make sure that staff who are dealing with people who are, who've had these negative experiences um, are recognising that and are willing to support people. Because yeah. you hit a very important point there, obviously 15% of the, you know, the social security powers are coming to, to the Scottish Parliament and the rest are still with Westminster. So would you suggest when we're talking about training for the various agencies and information, should it be in a written form that you know, when people are going along to the agencies and obviously the charter we would hope would be pinned up on the wall that people could see what their rights were. Uh, would it be written information to let people know the differences, what they can actually 
claim or, or directed to? That would be useful, yes. It should be available within the agencies. It should be available online. It should be directly provided in, in claim forms, if, you know, still with paper claim forms that a lot of people will um, prefer rather than applying online. It should be available in any way that people are accessing information. It's really, really important to be as accessible as possible. Yeah. Amy, did you want to come in on that particular one? Well, um, just to agree with Heather, and, and I suppose just if, if it, easy read accessible versions are very, very important, and I know it's a very complicated area, um, but uh, um, ways in which we can be clear and articulate um, um, what, what people's entitlements to are to those that um, potentially English isn't their first language mm. um, is, is really important. Thank you, thank you very much. I'll open it up to questions now. Jamie Balfour, you wanted to come in. Uh, good morning, and thank you very much for, for coming along. I, I wonder if I can dig down on two issues around carer's allowance. Um, and the first one is in regard to at the present link between the number of hours you care for somebody, but also that individual has to have a certain award, him or herself. Do you think there should be a, a, a division between that, that it doesn't matter what that person is getting for an award, if you're caring for the individual for a certain number of hours, you get the award. So there's no, we, we separate the two away. I'm interested to get your views on that. And secondly, at the moment, there's a, one award only. If you reach, I think, is it 35 hours a, a week, you get the award. Some people obviously care for 15, 20, 25 hours and don't get any. Do you think there should be some kind of tiering where maybe if you care for 20 hours, you get X amount, 25 etc. up to take the 35 hours, rather than just having one straightforward award, you get, you get it all if you hit that number, a more tiered downward approach. Okay. Um, both of those issues do come up regularly when we are consulting with carers and, and speaking with carers. So um, in terms of your first question about the link between carers allowance and the qualifying benefits, that is something that has been explored. We have discussed this with the Scottish Government and with carers, and there's, as with anything, there are positives and negatives to that. Currently, carers' allowance is quite, once you meet all the eligibility criteria for it, it is quite an easy benefit to receive. The application process is quite straightforward. Obviously, that's beneficial for carers and their families. However, the downside of that is that there are people who have got significant caring responsibilities for someone who doesn't receive a qualifying disability benefit. That can quite often be, um, you know, this is anecdotal, but it can quite often be people who are looking after frail elderly parents, and that can be who, who are not eligible for attendance allowance themselves, because that has quite strict eligibility criteria. And so that can cause problems, particularly for that age group, which is usually um, people who are in older, middle age, who may be balancing work and childcare with this caring responsibility as well. So there's a definite benefit there to, to removing the link between carer's allowance and the qualifying benefits, but at the same time, that would make the carer's allowance application process more complicated. There would have to be a different way of assessing whether a carer was, was providing care, and I'm not sure at this stage how that would be done, how complicated it would be, how much that would cost in terms of assessment, so that needs to be explored more widely. Um, for your second question about tiered amounts of carer's allowance, again, providing 35 hours of care or more per week is a substantial amount, and I'm sure it's quite obvious to, to the whole committee that people who are providing fewer hours of care than that are still providing substantial amounts of care, and again, that's going to impact on their abilities to, to stay in employment or to have enough leisure time um, outside of a caring role. So yes, that's something that we would be interested in exploring more, and again, it's something that has positives and negatives. There would be presumably some kind of, not really a means testing approach, but again, there would have to be an assessment of, of how that could be done and what the different levels of benefit were and what the different hours of caring would be. And again, with something like that, there's always going to be, I suppose, a cut-off where some people will not be eligible, but they're just not meeting the, the hours required. So again, that would cause difficulties for, for some people. It would need to be looked at in a lot more detail, I think, before we could make any kind of definitive statement on whether that would be appropriate. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, Children of Scotland, we're um, particularly um, concerned about um, young carers and um, feel that the current system really disadvantages them in terms of um, financial support for their, their role. Um, 
So, I mean, we're obviously welcoming the, the Young Carers grant announcement, but we have a, a couple of, of questions about um, carers assistance and, and um, um, carers allowance and how that um, uh, will work for um, particularly um, um, younger carers. Um, um, so I think we are quite interested in um, looking at uh, whether a pro rata potentially approach would work, um, recognising that many young carers mix caring responsibilities with being in school, for example, but still have a, a significant mm -hmm. role that they play and, and, a, and a, a significant responsibilities. Um, within the context of the proposal around the carers allowance supplement um, um, in the in the in the um, bill, um, we've got a question about um, job seeking linking it to job seeking allowance, and obviously, 18 to 24 year olds um, the low, getting a lower rate of job seeking allowance. So, we would like a bit of clarity on if the supplement is going to be at the higher rate for everybody, including those in the 18 to 24 um, age range. So, um, really, I suppose the principle that we're interested in is, is, is around ensuring there's parity uh, for, for carers regardless of what age they are. And I think one of the ways in which that will need to be addressed is recognising that caring, younger carers are less likely to be caring at 35 hours a week, um, but still have significant caring responsibilities. Um, and so I think a bit more flexibility and an exploration of a pro rata approach would be welcome from our perspective. Thank you. I know that you want to come in, Mark Griffin, in that particular one. Thanks, Kevin. It's just continuing on that eligibility criteria for a carer's allowance, and particularly on those who are caring for more than one person. Um, so at, at the moment, um, to qualify for carer's allowance, you have to be caring for a single person um, for 35 hours. Um, but there's a situation where you could be caring for two people individually uh, less than 35 hours, but cumulatively more than that 35 hours, and you don't qualify um, for carer's allowance. I wonder whether you feel that the Scottish Government should be looking at the eligibility criteria um, in this area. And secondly, um, on the, the Government's commitment um, to increasing carer's allowance for parents who care for more than one disabled child, um, do you think this should apply across the board rather than people who care for disabled children, if you care for um, more than one person. Um, do you think that the government should, should look at that as well? Hey, um, we have been approaching that with the Scottish Government and again just in general campaigning terms in, in how, we, how we approach carers allowance and how we gather carers views on it. That's something that comes up a lot as well. Um, and we have mentioned that in our written evidence submission. Um, the, the situation that you mentioned where somebody is caring for, for more than one person and it takes them way above the 35 hours a week um, eligibility criteria, that is something that's very, very prevalent. I think we don't hear a lot about that, but it is happening for sure. Um, and it does disadvantage people because, again, somebody who's got multiple caring roles is even more less likely to be able to to stay in employment, in paid employment, and so it's important that they they have access to to benefits and to and to an income for providing care. In terms of your, sorry, do you want to? Um, I, I mean, I think probably we'd defer to um, the expert here and and and, and agree and and the um, with, with what what Heather was saying around you know obviously if the, if the additional care and responsibilities um, should be should be considered and 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 you know recompensed accordingly. Back just, on a, just whether um, explicitly then you think that the government should be looking at eligibility criteria um, just now, um, the, the talk about not looking at eligibility criteria until they're further down the line on implementing the policy on um, paying carers allowance for more than one disabled child, but whether they should be looking at um, eligibility criteria at, at this stage. It's potentially something that should be looked at in, in policy terms at this stage, but I, I understand the government's reasons for, for not wanting to look at it un until we're further down the line. It is a big change in terms of a new social security agency and transferring benefits across, so I'm sure we need to look at all the different aspects of that, and it's more important to get things right and to get the initial commitments to a carer's allowance supplement and to increasing that 
and making sure that carers in Scotland are supported um, as soon as the, the new benefits transfer are over. But from a policy perspective, I believe it is being looked at. And again, we're consulting with carers on that to make sure that there's enough evidence and enough, enough information available to, um, to the government and to others to make sure that the decisions can be made in, in the correct way. Thank you. Alison Johnson, you wanted to come in. Yeah. Um, thank you, convener. I mean, carers allowance is currently defined as an income replacement benefit. Um, and if that is the case, I think several of the submissions suggest that people will be being paid at £2 an hour. Now, clearly being paid at £2 an hour when you could, in fact, be looking after several people. I mean, th that is no sort of salary. And I think, you know, if we're speaking about minimum wage and living wage, £2 an hour is neither. Um, I just wonder how, how adequate do you think this benefit really is? And if we're talking about dignity and respect, is it really possible to, to, to deliver dignity and respect if people simply don't have enough cash in the first place? Broadly, I don't think it is an adequate benefit, as you've identified. It's as an income replacement benefit. It's not particularly substantial. And uh, as we mentioned in our evidence submission, raising carers' allowance to the level of job seekers' allowance doesn't always seem to be the correct approach because although people can can stay on job seekers allowance for a long time it is meant to be a temporary benefit while someone is looking for work i'm not sure of the exact figures but there are substantial numbers of carers who have been on carers allowance for, for more than five years and will not never not be receiving the benefit whilst they're providing care so it is a long-term benefit that people need to survive so i think further down the line we do need to look at what is an adequate income replacement for people who are providing substantial amounts of care. Um, but again, from, from a policy perspective, this is being looked at, it is being considered, and again, it's potentially something we need more evidence on in terms of what, what would an adequate level of carer's allowance be. We need to consult with carers about that. We need to know what's financially sustainable. It's something that probably does need to be looked at long term to make sure there aren't any unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, from, a, um, from a children's perspective is, is, is the a recognition of the number of unknown carers that don't get any um, support at the moment and um, certainly um, when children are at school and coming home and uh, having to look after their parents and, and the huge responsibility of that with, with very little support available um, from services, let alone financially, um, I, you know, it, it's very difficult to see where dignity and respect feature within that. So um, that may be slightly without the, without the scope of, of the social security system to fully address, but um, I think um, in, in terms of the principles and how they're applied, I think it's really important that they um, look at how um, children and young people's care and responsibilities are recompensed as well. Could I, sorry, perhaps pick you up on that particular point you'd mentioned about the, the, the young carers previously? And obviously we've got Young Carers Grant, uh, which is coming in, and certainly I'm sure we've all met um, kids that going back to college, university, who have found it very difficult. And, you know, I've spoken to them and, and they welcome the, it's only £300, but they, <clears throat> they welcome that. When you're talking about, obviously, under 16 years of age, um, have you any ideas how we could support these kids? And when I mean, you're talking about a grant, or it might not just be monetary terms, because I'm, I'm aware of we had in an, another previous life in another committee we had did uh, an investigation, and a lot of young kids were um, didn't want there was a stigma attached, and they didn't want people to know that they were caring for their parents with particular problems. So, you know, I'm conscious of what you said about it might not just be social security. So I wonder if this committee could be helpful in passing information to perhaps Equal Opportunities Committee or whatever. I just wonder what your thoughts on that under 16 years of age, because there, there is a hidden uh, you know, amount of people there uh, that for stigma reasons don't want to talk about it. Yes, um, and obviously <coughs> with, with younger children, direct um, um, payment is not necessarily mm. appropriate. Um, um, there's also a number of young children that don't actually realise they're carers mm -hmm. as well, so that, that just do this and don't realise that it's not norm, 
part of everyday life and that actually that they should be getting support for it. Um, so I think it's about um, services, an adequate mm -hmm. service provision, um, enabling children to have the chance to be children so that they have those responsibilities taken off them. Um, and so, yeah, so obviously we'd hugely welcome um, your role as sort of advocate and for part of the wider system, because obviously social security sits within the wider context mm. of um, social care and social support um, in, the, in this um, country. And um, that would be very welcome within um, potentially the charter to recognise the role of social security within um, more broader social care in addressing poverty and disadvantage mm -hmm. and well-being of, of, of um, Scottish population. Okay. Did you want to say anything on that I'll, point, I'll just Hannah? absolutely echo what Amy said. Um, it's absolutely about provision of services and making sure that there's adequate support out there for, for young people. We, we work on the principle that young carers under the age of 16 should have <coughs> appropriate caring roles relieved. There should be services mm -hmm. put in place for the person that they're looking after. Um, as a matter of principle, that should be happening. Um, obviously, there's a lot of positive experiences that young people can have um, through, through caring, and living in a family where someone needs care, it's not always feasible to, to say that there will be no aspect of, of help being provided by them, because that's not how families work. If they do live in a family where someone is ill or disabled, then they will be supporting them and helping them in some way, and there's the emotional impact of that, as well as the actual practical tasks. That's not something that can be relieved. Um, but, but yes, making sure that there are adequate young carer support services for them as well and that they have opportunities for, for respite and breaks from caring, that the schooling is not interrupted. All this requires um, a number of services and supports to be put in place for them and it's important that adequate funding is available for that. Okay, thank you. Mark Griffith, you want to come in on that one? Yep, I, I would agree with the point that you make that people under 16, um, th there should be wider support through health and social care to alleviate any of their... Um, care and responsibilities, but with the cuts to uh, local government and other areas, well, that's a great principle to have. Sometimes it's, it's just not um, a realistic um, picture of what's happening on the ground, and it's just a, a question of why someone um, who is 15, potentially 15, in fourth year at school and has got a, a challenging year at school with exams, um, and is 15 and has the same care and responsibilities at home as someone in the same year group as them in fourth year but happens to have already turned 16 will get that support and whether it's appropriate to look at um, a payment in trust through a parent um, or something um, along those lines to make sure that um, people who just happen to be below that threshold but still providing the same level of care are being recognised and supported. There are two yeah. issues there. The, the first is, um, and it kind of comes back to what the, what the convener had mentioned about different, different legislation and how to influence different spheres of, of policy. Um, under the Carers Act, which has been implemented next year, young carers are defined as those under 18, or if they're still at school and are 18. So there's potentially a bit of a, a mismatch there between between legislation that supports young people up to the age of 16 and then of course in the kind of wider Scotland policy sphere for, for young people we work with people under the age of 26 um, quite a lot in in children and young people's policy so there's there's quite a lot of different levels there um, in terms of we, were you saying so supporting families in general rather than directly the young carer well th just recognise that it might not be appropriate through the social security system to pay um, someone under the age of 16. Um, that there, there could be other avenues. Uh, just as an example, um, a payment in trust to the parent rather than direct to the, to the child so that their uh, care and responsibilities and their efforts are, are recognised in, um, in the same way as someone who's six months older than Absolutely. I mean, in, in consultation around um, both this bill directly and the consultation last year that looked at wider principles of social security, the opinions and experiences of the parents of young carers were that they should be the ones who are financially supporting their children. And the majority of, of young carers do live in family situations where that is possible. Whilst this, the young carers grant and other kind of financial provisions for young carers will be useful for them, it is usually wise to look at a, a kind of whole family 
approach for that, whether that is a kind of payment in, in trust, as you say, or just more, more money or, or more support being available to the family as a whole will generally be, be beneficial, absolutely. Do you come in on that particular uh, one? I agree with what Heather. I don't think I have anything else to add. OK, th thank you. Adam Tompkins. Well, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, I, I wanted to ask what m uh, might be a very specific question that might have a very quick answer. I don't know. But in, in Glasgow, where the city I represent, um, there, and for all I know elsewhere as well, there is increasing concern um, about a gap in our um, welfare and family law provision for kinship carers. Um, and I wondered if you had any thoughts about whether there was anything that we needed to be aware of as a committee scrutinising this bill um, in, 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 to make sure that if you think that that gap is there, um, that it is plugged, if it can be, um, uh, through the provisions of, of, of this bill. Kinship care is quite specific. It's not my area of expertise. And although, although kinship care is a defined as carers, they're not within the, the client group that we work with unless there is care provision happening. So if the kinship carers are looking after children who've got additional needs. But I, yes, from, from what I've read and understand, there can be a gap there. And it's down to whether the, the local authority is, has, has recognised the kinship caring relationship, whether it's been formalised or not. And yeah. that depends on what, and that has an impact on what access to money the, um, the kinship carer has. Um, so I think it definitely does need to be looked at just to make sure that families aren't missing out. And yeah. is, from our perspective, from Carers Trust Scotland and other national care organisations, if there is a caring relationship within the kinship caring relationship, that has to be recognised as well. Yes, and, and I think this is, this is another area where there's different bits of legislation and policy that... Yeah. that um, you know, overlap, and I think clarity on that would be would be really welcome. Echoing Heather's point that quite a few um, kinship carers and indeed foster carers um, will uh, care for children with disabilities, mm. um, and it's higher than the, the general population. Mm. So I think that does need exploring more, um, and certainly we should be looking for where that links into the changes that have been made within the Children and Young People Scotland Act. Yeah, um, I think it's an area that's been underexplored actually. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it, th thank you for that. I, mean, I think you're absolutely right that um, uh, there seems to be some kind of variation from local authority to local authority within Scotland about the extent to which kinship care is recognised as being <coughs> an, an, a sort of informal variant of foster care that may or may not be um, liable to local authority financial support. Are, are kinship carers not eligible for uh, carers' allowance? If, if they are providing care to a young person who's got up to a, a disability or an illness then then yes again it's all dependent on income if they have you know if they don't meet the eligibility criteria for carers allowance um then they won't i'm not sure to be honest how any payment that's received by them in terms of kinship care affects their eligibility for other benefits it's not something i'm an expert on it would need to be looked at yeah thank you you want to come in back on that particular one um, no, I, I, likewise, I'm, I, I don't actually, I'm, I'm not an expert on kinship care either, but so, um, yeah, I think it's probably worth getting a bit more specific mm. evidence on that one from a um, relevant organisation, maybe Kindred or something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my, my understanding before we brought in kinship care, obviously it was lots of kinship carers are grandparents that looking after children if they're not guardians uh, and that did affect benefits and that was something that we had to really look at before we introduced the kinship care if they got that extra money it did knock on effect on any benefits that they were they were claiming uh, in that respect so that was why we went for the kinship care rather than social security or anything else in that but i think we should perhaps have a, a look at that again, have a explore that particular avenue does anyone else want to come in on that particular issue? Polly? Just to add a comment. Yeah, I mean, it, I believe it is a gap. And um, I know that in your submission that you talk about that the principles of the bill don't uh, specifically mention poverty or inequality. I, I think you're right about that. But what strikes me about this gap is that um, kinship carers um, who don't get, because they're not formalised arrangements, so you may not get the support, will more likely fall, to fall into the category of poverty and equality if they're not properly supported. Because as the, the convener says, very often it's grandparents who 
who come in because they don't want the, ch the child to be cared for by the local authority. So they're doing the right thing, but they're being penalised for it. And I think it might be worth some of the children's organisations just having a think about the impact on children. I know what you said in answer to Adam Tompkins, that the carers allowance um, only applies where there's a disability or illness, but obviously we're not talking about that. But I think there will be an impact on ch children if they're if the grandparents or who is the kinship carer doesn't have. But it's just worth, I think, children's organisations thinking about the impact on children. Do you want to come back on that, Amy? Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, um, you're right. And, and I think, um, um, obviously, uh, poverty and inequalities are, aren't equally <laughs> distributed um, across Scotland. And, and, and um, certainly, um, kinship... Um, kinship carers are experiencing more disadvantage than than, um, than others, um, and um, yes, it's another area that, that I mean, certainly there's other organisations in the children's sector that are more working more directly in this area that have been campaigning for adequate support for kinship carers for for, for many many years, and um, I know recognise that there have been progression and development in this area recently, um, but I'm sure they would say there's more to be done and would welcome additional attention to it. OK, okay we'll, we'll certainly look at that in the, yeah. the committee anyway, I'm sure. Does anyone want to come in and ask any further questions? No? Is there anything you want to ask of the committee? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I said that. OK, Amy, on you go. <laughs> um, there, well, there's a, there's a number of, of areas. <laughs> I'll try and be brief. No. Um, we're particularly um, interested in um, the top-up benefits area um, and would like the committee to consider how that part of, of the bill could be ex um, you know, um, explored and developed a little bit further. We feel it's, it's, it's quite um, limited in what in terms it, it, it offers at the moment. Um, we're obviously part of the, the, the campaign to top up child benefit, um, the Give Me Five campaign, which I know um, there's the, the, the committee I'm sure will be well aware of. Um, so really what potential there is to include that within within the, the scope of the bill, we would really welcome um, um, that additionally. Um, another area, so I'd be interested to hear what people's views are on, on the committee members' views are on that. Um, I suppose the other area where I'd be interested to see where you're thinking is, is around the scrutiny of, of the bill. Um, we feel that that part in, in, in the draft at the moment is, is, is very um, limited um, and we would welcome um, greater emphasis on, on independent scrutiny um, of the progress and what the actual markers and indicators of success will be of, of, of the bill. And, you know, obviously for us, linking that directly to um, reducing poverty and, and particularly reducing child poverty mm -hmm would be very welcome. Um, so again, a question about what, how you see this linking into the Child Poverty Bill, which is obviously going through uh, Parliament at the moment as well, because that refers directly to Social Security um, mm -hmm. as being a mechanism for reducing poverty. So clearly there's a need to link the two together and it's not really evident at the moment. So I think your thoughts and reflections on how that could happen too. That's great. Yeah, I'm just going to ask Heather if she wants to come in and then Adam will bring in. Heather, do you want to come in that? Yes, one? I do have a couple of points to, <laughs> to reiterate from, from previous evidence sessions that you've heard. Um, we would just like to align with um, the idea that if benefits can be offered, in, if it's benefits in kind or cash payments, that there should be a, a choice from the recipient. Mm. That should be first and foremost, and that cash <laughs> should be default. That aligns to principles of dignity and respect. And it's more appropriate in most cases for, for people to have the choice over that. Um, there are points that were made in our written evidence and in the National Care Organization's written evidence about short-term assistance as well. There's the potential for that to be overly complex. And again, in line with other organizations that have submitted evidence, it would generally be more appropriate for, for carers and people with ill health and disability to just have a continuation of that benefit rather than a specific and different application for, for short-term assistance. I, I know that the, print, the parts of the bill are quite broad looking at that at the moment and the detail will be in regulations, but it's definitely something to, to consider. There's already a run-on for, for carers' allowance um, for some instances, such as when the cared-for person dies or potentially if there's hospital admission for the cared-for person. So it is possible for that to happen. Um, 
I think those are my two main points, actually. That's thank, you very, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm glad I asked the, the question. Adam Tompkins, you want to come in on this one? Thank you, Kim, Kim, <laughs> you know, Heather has just anticipated um, a little bit of what I was going to say in response to um, Amy's um, prompts, which I thought were very helpful. Thank you. Um, a number of the issues that you um, raised, Amy, are not dealt with in the bill because the scheme of the bill is that those issues will be dealt with in regulations to be made under the bill. Um, and one of the concerns that the committee has been keen to explore with witnesses throughout our inquiry into this bill is whether um, you think that um, the balance between what's in the bill, sometimes called on the face of the bill, and what's to be left for secondary instruments is the right balance. Um, and whatever your answer to that question, whether you think that there are adequate means for scrutinising the making of secondary instruments under this bill, whether that be scrutiny in this parliament or scrutiny by an independent body that might need to be set up that might or might not be mod modelled on the UK's Social Security Advisory Committee. So the convener invited you to ask questions to us, and my response is to ask those questions back, back to you, if that's permitted. Absolutely. Amy, do you want to come in on that one? Yes, of course. Um, that seems to be fair enough. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose we're going to always want things to be in primary legislation because that makes it more secure and, and future-proofs it so that we, we know where we're, where we're, where we're at and where, 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 what the system's going to be. Um, we can recognise that that's not always going to be possible. I think there could be more in the primary legislation on the face of the bill than there is currently, um, particularly around the, 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 the um, scrutiny section and the accountability uh, section, section six, which is just an annual report at the moment, which I don't doesn't feel sufficient. So I think there could be um, something in there about an independent commission, whether it's the Poverty and Inequality mm -hmm. Commission, or, 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 which I know the Poverty Alliance mm -hmm. have suggested, um, or, or something else. I think that could be in the primary legislation um, and, and isn't uh, currently. Um, clearly, some of it will have to go into regulations, yeah. I think there's more that could be in it at the moment. Heather, did you want to come back on that one? And I think Jeremy wants to come in as well. Yes, um, I suppose just to just to echo Amy's points and points that I've heard in, in other evidence sessions, we we did probably expect a little bit more to to be in the primary legislation, but again, understand the the reasons for you know the complexities of of what this bill is trying to achieve and the fact that it can be easier to to change or amend regulations um, at, at short notice. Obviously, there are negatives to that as well, and I would agree that primary legislation is more more secure and is is open to more more scrutiny. Um, the the second point that Adam Tompkins made about the um, scrutiny within Parliament and also with an external body as well that is something that would be appropriate and is something that we're we're interested in hearing more about. What kind of scrutiny body is going to be set up alongside this to to make sure that there's adequate um, eyes on what's changing. Thank you. Jeremy, you wanted to yeah. come in? Or... I mean, just very quickly, just going back to a point Heather made, and thank you, I think it was very helpful summing up, in regard to whether it should be a cash or in-like benefit, and the default should be cash, which I think is absolutely right. Has anyone, or do, has any of your organisations done any work in regard to the costing of an, a benefit in kind? Because that could prove to be more expensive than a cash payment and is any, do you know of any information for the committee where we could see how much it would actually cost if someone said, my preference is not to have the cash, but to have a care come in for two hours a day or something like that? Yeah, then. I'm not sure if there's anything like that available at the moment. I will, I'll have a look and I'll get back to the committee at a, a later date if that information is available, if I can source it. But I think... What, a lot of the comparisons are made with perhaps the Scottish Welfare Fund and similar kind of setups, which is different because that's obviously for emergency assistance where it might be more appropriate for, for say, a, a household appliance like a fridge or something mm. to, to be purchased because there's, there's an emergency and that's the defined need. In terms of benefits in kind taking the form of social care support, such as a care worker coming in, I'm not sure whether that would always be appropriate. There's already quite a lot of confusion as to how Social Security interacts with 
social care provision and particularly self-directed support now that people are receiving direct payments. And I have spoken to a lot of carers and a lot of people who receive that kind of support who aren't sure whether social care support will affect the benefits, vice versa. I think that's potentially more complicated than it needs to be. And if someone's eligible for support, then that shouldn't be interacting with the social security system. Obviously, it's something that does need to be looked at in further detail. And if somebody isn't eligible for support but is eligible for benefits, then that may be more appropriate for them. It's very difficult to give a kind of broad approach to that because it's so dependent on people's specific situations. But again, I would reiterate my earlier point that providing cash benefits is far more aligned with principles of dignity and respect and, and investment in, in, in people through social security. Thank you. Ben McPherson, you wanted to come in on that one? Thank, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, to uh, something that Amy mentioned earlier, I just wanted to bring you back to, the, to that point, this point at the beginning of evidence. You, you warmly welcomed at uh, the beginning the, the ethos of the new social security system and this legislation to be based in dignity and respect, um, as, as I do as well. The, the principle, as uh, drafted in, in the bill at one point, uh, sorry, one C, um, are you content with the wording as it, as it is there in order to reflect those values and, and, and that ethos as you... You know, right to come in. It, I mean, broadly... As you welcome it. Broadly, yes. I mean, I think um, um, it's really welcome in terms of framing it in terms of human rights and in and using words like dignity are very important and I suppose the, the important thing is, is, is having them up there but also how they're applied and, and how they work and, and, and but does it feel like they actually embody the system so I guess it's just a starting point so I suppose I mean the, I'll just reiterate the points I made earlier which is, is, is whether there's potential to um, specifically highlight um, child rights within within the, the principles as well and that recognising that well human rights affect all humans regardless of age but that the, we, we in Scotland have a particular focus on, on, on children's rights as well and, and, and recognising their rights within the social security system and the, the, the point about um, it, um, um, its role in, in addressing poverty and inequalities as well I would see is another area that it, it could specifically um, mention. Um, the other principle that you might want to consider um, putting in um, would be around a uh, principle of accessibility and simplicity where possible so that, that the principle is, is that we make things as easy for people um, as, as we can. Um, so there are some additions that could be made to it but generally speaking what's there already is, 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 is good so um, we want to be critical of it as it's a very good way of, of framing things. Okay, thank you for that. <clears throat> yeah. Heather, did you want to come in and quote? No, that means so. okay. Um, well, thank you very much. You've certainly given us food for thought in that respect, and I'm sure we've all written down the issues that you've raised, and we'll have a chat about them as well. Um, so, thank you, thank you very much, and uh, we'll just suspend for a couple of minutes till we get our next set of witnesses. Thanks a lot.
Can I just welcome the second panel of witnesses? Uh, Derek Young, Senior Policy Officer, Age Scotland. Norman Kerr, Vice Chair, Scottish Fuel Poverty Forum. Suzanne Mundy, Director at MECOPP. <laughs> I'm sure you can explain what it is to, to, to the, the members of the public that are in the, in the, the gallery there. As I said pre to the previous uh, witnesses, uh, I'll start off with the first question. I'll just do an overall question, <coughs> and then we'll bring in members as they as they come in. In earlier, you know, uh, evidence sessions, you know, I've asked these uh, questions and the views on the principles and the proposed charter because it affects the overall uh, social security bill. So, can I ask yourselves what are your views and in what ways do you see the principles? and the charter influencing the organisational culture of the new agency. So who wants to start off first? Uh, Derek Young. Derek. Uh, well, Norrie seemed to be indicating that I should start, so okay. perhaps I should. Um, well, uh, we, we welcome the principle-based approach. Uh, it is not the most common format or model of legislation necessarily, but there are other examples that have uh, followed that approach. Um, we in particular welcome the first three principles, which we think are very clear and explicit. Um, there are uh, some queries about the practical implication of some of the later principles. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those have been articulated both in our written evidence and the written evidence that you've received from other organisations, such as the Health and Social Care Alliance, for example. Um, and I suppose the broader point is essentially what impact on a day-to-day -day level will the principles practically have? Uh, and I know this is a point that Mr. Tompkins has raised with other witnesses and other evidence sessions and so on. Um, w there is certainly a possibility, that, um, the lowest level of possibility is that the principles have purely symbolic uh, effect. Now that would be, I think, regrettable. Mm -hmm. it, it may well be that they help to shape administrative practice uh, and the decisions that are made by officials working for the agency, for example. Um, but that will depend a lot upon the uh, practical operations of the agency, mm -hmm. which, which aren't really contained in the bill because of the model of the executive agency which the government has chosen. Um, but the, 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 the final question would be to what extent can individual applicants and uh, recipients rely upon the principles when uh, making their applications or when challenging decisions? And that isn't actually clear from the terms of the bill itself. I think we would prefer it to be. Um, as far as the Charter is concerned, uh, we have largely viewed the Charter as a way of explaining in ordinary language to potential recipients and claimants what their expectations and entitlements should be. To that extent, that's very helpful. It's also helpful that the Scottish Government have, I think, made the point that they want that Charter to be co-produced pretty broadly. So the experience of users of the system, people who have that direct experience, will inform what the Charter says. Uh, we also agree with the point made by witnesses in the previous uh, half of, of this meeting that it should be uh, accessible uh, and something that people who have, particularly from our point of view, cognitive challenges, um, but other accessibility requirements, that it's something that's accessible to them and has a real impact on them. But the, the structure of the bill says that there will be reporting on the extent to which the charter is being implemented annually. But there are certainly more robust forms of accountability that are available. Uh, and we are not sure that that in itself will be the most effective form of accountability to try and translate the principles, which are extremely welcome, extremely valuable, into the day-to-day -day practice. Thank, thank you very much, Derek. Um, Norman, did you want to go? Yes, thank you, convener. Um, the Fuel Poverty Forum is quite a wide body of interests, ranging from the energy regulator down to colleagues at Age Scotland. In terms of our response, that's been fairly narrow and focuses on mm -hmm. um, two very specific areas. But I don't think that we would disagree um, with uh, colleagues at Age Scotland on their response to this. Um, I think it is helpful that the, the Charter gives more explanation um, to help people understand. Um, the principles based is one that we've seen moving elsewhere. The regulator, for example, in the energy industry talks about moving to a principles-based approach. And um, so therefore, um, we are not unhappy with that. Thank you very much. Suzanne, did you want to? Uh, yeah. Um, 
you know, like, like colleagues, we, we, we welcome the, the principle-based approach, but principles by their very nature are aspirational. And, and we do have a concern about how they are applied in the day-to-day -day operation of the new social security system in, in Scotland. And we, we do see the charter playing a role, but based on feedback from our service users, you know, there are issues of how the application of the charter is, is monitored, um, the accountability of the, 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 the system um, in terms of applying the charter. And one thing that came out very, very clearly from um, our work with carers was the, the idea that the charter itself is almost underpinned by a set of, of standards which we feel are more robust and, and more measurable. Um, and again, it's about people having redress if they feel that the system has not operated as it should have. Um, we believe that the, um, there is a, a vital role for independent advocacy in enabling people to almost hold the system accountable in terms of their personal experience of, of the system as, as well. Thank you. I could just pick up on a, a couple of mm -hmm. things that you said there before I bring the other committee members. Uh, both members mentioned about the Charter being more robust and accountability. And then I think it was yourself, Derek, that mentioned about the principles uh, challenging. Could you maybe expand on what you mean by that? I, mean, I don't want to get into courts of law or whatever, but I just feel as though you're kind of going along that line. Okay, well, um, a point we made in our written evidence is that I think it's Principle D is articulated that the Scottish ministers have a role in ensuring uh, that people receive what they're entitled to, whereas there are other provisions in, elsewhere in the bill which specify that Scottish ministers are to do something. Um, so it rather implies that, that it, it ought to be possible for it to be articulated that they have a duty to ensure that rather than simply a role. I think that would be a, a more reassuring form of language. Uh, we alluded to the fact um, that points have been made which we endorse by the Health and Social Care Alliance about what evidence will be relied on for Principle E, I think it is, and what, how do you define continuous improvement for the purpose of Principle F. The final principle uh, reflects efficiency and value for money, uh, which is a very noble ideal, particularly in a time of constrained public finances. But it's notable that in debates that have taken place elsewhere about social security, um, efficiency and value for money are sometimes used as a pretext for restricting either the eligibility criteria themselves or the way in which they are applied. So the question we have around that final principle is to what, what, what happens when occasions where there may be a conflict between that principle and some of the other principles, such as the first one establishing uh, social security as a human right. And it, the bill itself is not clear, perhaps it, it, you know, it might not need to be, but some clarity would be helpful, whether in the bill or elsewhere, about in situations where the principles seem to come into conflict, how those are resolved. Thank you very much. Suzanne, did you want to come back in that one, as you had mentioned, particularly about the Charter? If not, I can bring in other committee members. Um, I might come back to that later, if that's Absolutely. okay. Absolutely. <laughs> You're allowed to, to think about it, not a problem at all. Uh, Polly McNeil, you wanted to come in here. I think it's Ben McPherson after that. Yeah, um, first, can I, can I compliment you on your submission? I think it's really comprehensive and provides a lot of clarity. And that's the first uh, point I was drawn to, is this the debate we've just had with the convener about whether or not the bill is presently drafted will deliver a principle-based approach. So I, I, I do think it's worth spending a wee bit more time on that because um, other witnesses have said something similar. I think it's the central question. Everyone wants a principle-based approach, but, the, but in its current form, is it going to actually deliver that? But I noted that in response to the convener, you talked about, well, a set of standards and, read and redress for individuals, and that's the most important thing. Can individuals rely on the principles contained within the bill to enforce um, their you know, particular um, issue, whether that's um, a speedy... Uh, uh, decision um, or an appeal decision, so I would apply to everything. So I just wondered how, if you could go into a wee bit more detail then, if the committee were to take a view, that, 
similarly then how we could go about fixing it. Did, I mean, for example, do you think then that there needs to be more in the face of the bill then about a set of standards? So, I mean, just to give an example, so if, if there's a principle in the bill that says that you know everyone's entitled to a speedy decision in the new social security agency, what does that actually mean? Um, so would that suggest then that there needs to be a set of standards which is more specific about timescales, for example, that because what can you rely on if the principle is that and we all have a different view about it? Um, I know we're going over the same ground, but I'm really interested to get a bit more detail if it's possible, because I think this is an area that the committee really need to look in some depth. Suzanne. Yep. Um, I think that's a difficult one, because very often timescales will depend on local circumstances. And whilst you can talk about reasonable timescales, reasonable timescales are quite, quite difficult to define. I don't think there's any harm, though, in looking at um, a timescale which should not exceed X yes. amount of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if... Well, the, the, the only time limit that's in the bill at the moment is related to the mandatory um, reconsideration provisions, which is after, I think, it's 28 days. Um, if, if, it's, if reconsideration is not made within that time frame, it's, it's um, it, an automatic trigger occurs, which is a difference from the way that uh, our mandatory reconsideration as opposed to redetermination uh, happens at a UK level. I mean, there will certainly have to be detail of that kind. Whether it's necessarily required in the bill or not, um, I mean, it's a matter of debate. I don't, I don't know. You would, you would see a lot of that type of detail, for example, in the Westminster model, in, in the regulations which, which follow. Certainly, as opposed to standards of decision-making and how people feel that they have been treated by the decision-making process, um, there are good models that can be followed elsewhere. Recently, there's been an update to the national health and care standards, which are framed very much in terms of outcomes. A lot of the planning uh, for the delivery of the new agency seems to be outcome-based as well. That's a welcome approach. Whether that needs to be in statute or not, I, I, I wouldn't give evidence to the fact that I think it must be in statute. For example, the National Health and Care Standards are not in st statute. But we have yet to see what practical impact they have on the actual improvement of quality in, in regulated care settings. So I, I, I think we should try the model that's being proposed, but be willing to reconsider it and see if more sort of robust definition in statutory terms of what standards of decision making are to be applied might be necessary. I do think that <coughs> there are certain situations where we, where we do need to look at um, quicker timescales. So for example, one, um, in, in our focus group, the uh, issue of assistance with funeral payments was, was brought up and the difficulties that individuals who are applying for assistance are experiencing both in the, um, the length of time that it takes to establish eligibility, but also the length of time it can take to process a payment. And there are some situations where um, you know, somebody has passed away and the burial of the body has to take place within a set time period. And we have had situations where literally communities have had to fundraise in order to pay for funeral costs up front before, you know, they, they've been able to establish whether they're able to get assistance with funeral payments. So I think there are particular circumstances where we do need to look at whether we can speed up decision making. Could I can I just clarify? Mm. That's at the moment the funeral payments. Yes. At the moment, so obviously we're looking at uh, a different uh, yeah. approach. So it's just to clarify for that yeah. at the moment, it's not. Mm -hmm. safe. Okay. Pauline, did you want to come back in again? Uh, no, that's really helpful. Um, I have a second question on uh, something which you certainly drawn to my attention. I wasn't aware of, um, which is the question of mixed aged couples. Um, now, the bit that caught my attention was when you say that uh, and as of September 2018, when the Universal Credit Mixed Age Couples Rules come into effect, it will no longer be possible for new claimants to receive pension credit until the younger of the couple has also attained pension credit age. Um, I was quite staggered by that. I suppose depending on the level of the age gap might, <laughs> <laughs> might determine how annoyed you might be about that. 
Um, anyway, I, I just wanted to get on the record. Um, if you could just speak to that, that would be really helpful. Suzanne, do you want to come in? I, I don't recall that in our... No, All right, it's there. It says concerns, one of them. concerns, yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah. Your, well, your paper. It's, it's certainly in Age Scotland. This is uh, an issue that we have been seeking to highlight. It's, it's little known about, and so I'm not surprised, uh, Ms McNeil, that you know, it's kind of a surprise to you. Uh, and as you've alluded to, there could well be couples in the same household who have a very significant age difference. So that would mean that the present rule, when the older of the two, the person who attains the pension credit age first, uh, becomes eligible for pension credit, at the point at which the mixed age couples rules come into effect, you know, that eligibility would cease to be the case until their younger partner also did. So it has a number of very uh, potentially detrimental effects. Firstly, pension credit is probably worth about £100 a week more than universal credit, so it will, it will have the effect of significantly reducing the household income. It will also mean that, for example, universal credit is subject to the sanctions regime uh, in order to prove your eligibility for work, your willingness um, to undertake specific agreed targets and so on. Uh, that's not the case for pension credit. Uh, but that will affect the household income, even though there is somebody of pension credit age in it. Um, it also brings into possible effect some of the rules which don't apply in terms of pension credit, but do in terms of universal credit. And the principal one which will affect this committee and this bill is the, is the under-occupancy charge for housing benefit, which will become the housing cost element of universal credit. Um, so at the moment, if you're a pension credit recipient, the, the under-occupancy charge rules do not apply to you. But if you're a universal credit uh, recipient, they would. So if, as, if for the period of time during which this mixed age couple scenario subsists in the same household, it means that for that period, unlike now, when the rules change, you could have potentially someone of pension age and above subject to the under occupancy charge. Now, because of the policy of the Scottish Government, which is to mitigate the effects of the under occupancy charge through discretionary housing payments, it potentially means that there'll be, a, there'll be a, a group of people which will have a greater call on the discretionary housing payment budget, at least until the rules implementing the underpaid occupancy charge can be changed. So there's a financial impact on the Scottish Government through the operation of these, even though they are reserved benefits in the operation of universal credit. It is a, a complex area, certainly one that people who are unaware of it, I have found some difficulty trying to explain uh, this to them. But what it also means is that there could be a an added benefit in improving benefit uptake of pension credit right now, before September 2018. So if there are couples who are currently affected by this but who haven't claimed pension credit, if they were to do so, they would come in before the rules change. It also means it would reduce the potential extra liability on discretionary housing payments for a while. So there's a potential for the Scottish Government actually to save money by increasing the uptake of a reserved benefit in pension credit, whereas usually benefit uptake campaigns have a double-edged sword because the, however more successful you are, the further financial draw there is on the same government's own spending. Here it would be a potential for the Scottish Government to improve benefit uptake rates. People would get more access to the money they're entitled to already, but also it would obviate a potential future spend by the Scottish Government because of the consequences of the reserve change and the Scottish Government's own policy. I've tried to make that as clear as possible, but I don't know if I have succeeded. <laughs> I think I'm going to read the official report. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's really helpful, not just in relation to this bill, but obviously the ongoing debate about universal credit, because, of course, the pension credit system was brought in, basically, um, to stop pensioners falling into poverty. I mean, I imagine there might even be an argument about age discrimination. I mean, you certainly think twice about marrying somebody 10 years younger than you if um, you thought... Uh, <laughs> You think that far ahead? Um. In response to that, Mr. McNeil, it's one of the, this is not the only area, but it's certainly an area which you can argue there's a financial incentive not for couples for couples not to stay together if they're on low incomes, and actually they might be financially better off to separate and not be in the same household, because then the person of pension credit age could claim pension credit. They wouldn't be undercut by living with someone who was under uh, pension age at the same time. Thank you very much. I'll leave it there. I mean, I, I simply, I'm certainly be putting in my sort of uh, social media columns that £100 pound a week is quite significant to lose to change the system. This is, so thank you for highlighting that.
Thank, thank you. Ben McPherson. Thank you, con Convener. Good, good morning, panel. I just have a, a number of questions uh, based primarily on, on the principles, which I know we've been, been talking about already. I just wanted to ask, first of all, um, Derek Young in particular, the discussion earlier around scrutiny, accountability, redress. Um, is, there a, is there a position in your view to, to think about should the principles have more of a, a link to Scots or international law? Because this is something that's been proposed by other witnesses in our evidence. Well, I'm aware of the international uh, law right to social security. I must say I wasn't terribly aware of it before uh, the start of the process of this bill. Um, clearly, it's in a different position from a number of other international human rights instruments, particularly the European Convention, which applies to everything that the Parliament and the government and public bodies in Scotland do. Um, so I think it's a very useful um, guide to the, to the aspirations we ought to hold ourselves accountable to. I know that somewhere in the policy memorandum it suggested that actually the avoidance of criticism at international level, that uh, the, the government hasn't lived up to the right to social security should be one of the ambitions of the system. Um, and I actually think that's slightly unfortunate language. I think we ought to articulate a much more aspirational and positive uh, purpose for the system rather than the avoidance of criticism. But um, it, it, I think it's, it's certainly valuable to articulate that um, social security is a human right. I think in other evidence sessions you've heard, that doesn't necessarily mean that people have a human right to individual forms of assistance. That's not what's intended. Uh, I think what is intended is that there is a, there is a functioning and effective system designed to ensure that people do not fall into destitution uh, and poverty, um, that the rules are clear, that the processes are fair, and that things are explained to people in a way that they can understand. If we meet those aspirations, I think we'll be a long way towards meeting the international uh, duty or, or there's no right to social security. There is a substantive element to it, but it applies, in, it, it, as all human rights or many human rights are, couched in very broad terms. So like the principles themselves, you could say, you know, well, people shouldn't be left in uh, destitution. There is a, a broad debate to be had about what that means in practical terms, in terms of amounts of money at certain times and regularity to individuals. And that, those are issues I would imagine, principally for this parliament to determine. The difficulty around having this debate right now, of course, is that those details are not in the bill. They're to be left to regulations. And there is a different form of parliamentary scrutiny to be adopted when those eventually come. Uh, what I would certainly suggest is that an independent scrutiny body would assist in the same sort of model as we have the Social Security Advisory Committee. So there can be detailed and well-informed scrutiny of the regulations when they eventually come. So, so that would be preferable in your view rather than a, a reference to binding it, the, the, the principle in Scots or international law in the face of the bill? Uh, we, we don't have a very specific view about the, the form of the binding nature that the principle should take. But we think it's very important that that be clarified in the bill. Because otherwise, and I think there's a point that Professor Tom Mullen and others have made in their written evidence, if, it's, if it remains uncertain, then effectively that would have to be resolved by litigation, which would be expensive, time consuming, and probably unnecessary. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Um, if any, do any other panel members want to come in on, on that point, or I, I'll move on. I think it was importantly raised um, in, in Meekup's evidence, uh, particularly uh, Suzanne, around accessibility. And I took part in the workshop with Meekup service users and yourselves uh, and yourself around around that point. The the Scottish government position is uh, that detailed rules around equality and accessibility would be in the subordinate legislation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Thereafter, and, and, and in the in the the charter, and that that uh, charter would be co-produced, co and I think there's there's uh, strong support for that. So, in, in terms of another principle around accessibility, would that be a, a very high level, a very a, a general level, just to yeah. to make sure that that's a clear principle? Is that what you're arguing for? I mean, I'm aware the other uh, witnesses to the committee have asked for what has been described as an equality clause on the face of the bill. I myself am not sure what shape that would take. I think in terms of an additional principle, I'd certainly like the committee to consider one based around the principles of equity of access, because I feel that would 
encapsulate a, a lot of the practical measures that, that, that would be necessary. So, for example, in, in our evidence, we, we cautioned against an over-reliance on digital technology because of the, the fact that many people will ha not have access to um, computers, people may not be um, digitally, digi I can't even say it, I'm digitally not literate <laughs> clearly, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was um, good to see that, you know, that, that there, there was consideration of actually face-to-face -face support with, 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 um, within the, the new agency. Um, so I think equity of, of access would be uh, an important principle to, to consider. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for mm -hmm. clarifying that. And just one last point, mm -hmm. convener, um, and it, it's around the... Uh, the point of advocacy that you, mm. you raised as well, and it's it's a, uh, a potential principle for inclusion yeah. that other witnesses have also mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, would you of, be of the uh, persuasion that if there was a right to advocacy, that this should be uh, for certain individuals in certain circumstances rather than a, than a blanket right? Is it is it a right to advocacy that's derived from the fact that that MECOP um, while supporting mm -hmm. minority ethnic carers, recognises that in specific circumstances for specific individuals, advocacy would be would be meaningful and important. Mm -hmm. I think the benefit system as it is, is, is really very, very complex, even for people who are steeped in the system. So to ask a lay person to navigate their way through that without support, I, I think is very, very, Difficult. I think that potentially when people are also going between two systems, for example, Westminster-based benefits and Scottish-based benefits, that adds uh, another layer of complexity. I think that it's very difficult to determine in what circumstances people have a right to advocacy. I think a lot of people do self-select. There will clearly be people, perhaps in more straightforward circumstances, who feel that they're very competent and able to do that, or with minimum support. I think adv advocacy comes in when people are experiencing difficulties. So for example, when they're applying for a benefit and perhaps they disagree with the outcome, and you need that advocacy then to take forward an appeal or a review of the decision. So I think going right back to basics and echoing what previous witnesses have said, the system does need to be as simple as possible, as easy, navigable. I can't, do you know what? I need to put my teeth in today. <laughs> navigable as possible. Um, but... I would not like to say in which circumstance, you know, whether people mm -hmm. have um, a blanket right to advocacy or only in certain circumstances. I think there are individuals that will require perhaps more help at the start of the process. So, for example, you know, we talked about people perhaps <coughs> with cognitive mm -hmm. difficulties. I can see a right there to, to advocacy. Um, mm -hmm. I know. That, that's really helpful. And, uh, my consideration around it for awareness is just whether um, a blanket right to advocacy is, is required or whether we only need to make sure that those services are available for, for those who really need it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think it's, it's clear from, from what you're saying mm -hmm. that there would, if we get the system right and it is simplified and it is accessible, mm -hmm. that there are those who won't need advocacy. But clearly in certain circumstances and uh, yeah. in, 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 in situations where there's, there's more complicated steps to mm -hmm. go through, for example, as you said, if there's a, a situation where there's a challenge or, or, mm -hmm. or, or something for, to that effect, that advocacy would be important for, for the, the, the service users that, that that you see on a, on a regular yeah. basis. But I'm also thinking that it's important to distinguish between advocacy and other forms of support. So again, if we think in terms of the communities that I work with, language support, which is a lot of what we provide, is very, very different from advocacy. So it's important to make that distinction. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, convener. I know there's a couple of members want to come in with supplementaries, I think. Jeremy Balfour, do you want to? Oh, sorry, Jeremy Balfour and then Alison Johnson. Did you want to come in a supplementary, Alison? Sorry. Yeah, um, 
Just picking up on what Suzanne Mundy has been saying there about the complexity of the system, particularly when it's running in tandem with with the Westminster system. Um, I suppose some complexity is, is probably inevitable, but one way to deal with that is to offer benefits without an application, which Section 35 of the mm -hmm. Bill allows for. Um, the Social Security Agency could actively look at what someone might be entitled to without yeah. them having to go through another application. I suppose it's a bit like the system we have with cold weather mm. um, payments and winter fuel payments, which many people don't have to apply for. They're yes. passported from, from other benefits. And I just wonder if that's something the panel thinks. Um, it will also help tackle low take-up of benefits. Is that something that the panel thinks the Social Security system in Scotland should be looking at? Uh, Suzanne, did you want to come in, or I'll Derek? Derek, and then I'll come in. Okay, this may give Suzanne some opportunity to consider. Um, so, I think a point we have made in our written evidence, certainly we have made in broader communications, is not to just look at the social security system exclusively, but that where people have entitlements to social security, they very probably have other needs. And if there are different assessment processes for those, that can be time consuming and difficult. So, for example, it's very common for people for disabilities who are older to also have care needs and who therefore also undergo a care assessment if they, as a res um, result of getting older and having established care needs, then want to move locations to be closer to family, for example, they may have to go through another care needs assessment with a different local authority that isn't passported automatically. Similarly, for certain types of disability, like attendance allowance, it doesn't passport automatically, to, for example, to entitlement to a blue badge for a vehicle. Mm -hmm. So if there were an opportunity to look at the different forms of assessment, not just including the social security, but beyond that, and what are the ways in which those processes could be streamlined, then there are people who would certainly find that extremely advantageous because we hear quite a bit from older people who complain about having to give essentially the same answer to the same question several different times. Mm -hmm. Um, Suzanne, do you want to put that and, I, and I think that does happen um, on, you know, sort of very, very small scale, perhaps with individual organisations. So, for example, benefit clinics that are, are run by CABs will often look at underlying entitlements either to other benefits or other services and provide that advice and information at that point. And that certainly has been very, very useful. Thank you. Mm. Okay, uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, we were talking earlier on about choice, either in cash or in kind, mm. and it brought to mind about winter fuel payments yeah. in, in that respect, mm. uh, you know, uh, fuel poverty and, and that type of thing. I know, Norman, that your group has looked at that in the paper that you've submitted as well. So I'd just like to ask you know, the, the panel what the thoughts are on, on the either in kind, you know, a choice of either money or in kind, and also about the winter uh, fuel payments and the cold weather payments too. So I'll start off, Norman, with yourself and then the rest of the panel. Thank you, convener. Um, I think a choice would be appropriate for some people, and I'm sure they would welcome that. Um, I think our concern is where um, you have a variety of different fuels and, for example, if you are simply making that payment to electricity um, or to gas, but someone was off the gas grid and relying heavily on oil. So I think it, it may be appropriate for some people to say, yep, please provide that money directly to my supplier, whoever that supplier of a particular fuel may be. Um, but it's also about the timing of, of that. Mm -hmm. And I know you, your parliamentary colleague in Westminster, Mike Weir, um, raise this issue time and time again, um, particularly where people are off the gas grid and having to buy oil and not being able to buy a full tank of oil because the timing of the payment, the winter fuel payment, has meant that they didn't have all of the cash up, up front. Um, so again, if you're giving it to a supplier, um, it limits the ability of the consumer to shop around for a good deal, probably more so um, when you're relying on oil or solid fuel or, or LPG, where you might want to shop around. Um, I think if you are to pay it to a supplier for gas or electricity, you're kind of tying the individual into that supplier. Um, some people may be very happy with that, um, but it, it kind of disengages them from the market. 
and we're doing a lot currently to try and get people more engaged in the market um, to shop around, to think about um, changing their payment method, to think about their supplier. So for some people it will be entirely right, they'll be very happy and settled <coughs> and will want to continue with that, but others I think for the, the cash payment would use that um, perhaps to shop around for, for a, better, a better deal. So it's not necessarily right for everybody, I think, is what I'm, what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Suzanne, did you want to come in on that then? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in our submission, we, we, we noted that we thought there was merit in, look, um, in looking at whether the, the winter fuel payment could be extended beyond its, its current constituency. Um, and we would argue that I mean, fuel poverty is, is a, um, a really significant issue for people with disabilities and long-term conditions. And sometimes by association carers, if they are living within that household, and there's a significant body of evidence that says winter fuel payments, you know, does um, disproportionately impact on, on those groups of, of people. Um, and it may be that by virtue of the, the illness or disability that you have, that you do need to turn your heating on earlier in the year, that you may have to have it at a higher temperature. But currently, you know, people um, who, who um, um, don't fall within the, the, the current um, criteria are, um, are not uh, eligible for, for that payment. So we believe there is merit in looking at extending that. We'd also like to highlight um, a particular group of people that we work with, and that is the gypsy traveller community who, who live on sites. And it's been brought to our attention mm. that there is, um, that, that the utility account is very often held by the local authority. And that makes it problematic because people do not have individual accounts, that they actually cannot shop around for the cheapest tariff. And that is, again, something that, you know, increases fuel poverty for particular groups of, of people. Mm -hmm. Derek, you want to come? Sure. Well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted the committee is looking at winter heating assistance because uh, although it's not the most significant amount of money of the current spend across the £2.9 billion that's, that's to be devolved, it is the payment that touches the lives of most people. So I think altogether there's 1.4 million people who receive one or more of the benefits <coughs> articulated in the, in the bill, and 1.1 million of them are winter uh, fuel recipients. Um, on the, I, I agree entirely with the points that uh, Norrie's made about um, off-grid properties in particular. And the broader point that that points to on the non-cash payments is that I don't think you've heard from any witness who suggested that there should be anything other than a system that the potential recipient would have to elect first to receive a non-cash uh, form of support rather than uh, have it foisted upon them. I don't think that's anyone's in intention. That being the case, I think it would be helpful to have that clarified in, in the bill. Um, for all of the reasons that's been mentioned, you can look at other forms of non-cash support that exist in the public sector. We've alluded to the uh, Azure payment <coughs> cards that are used for refugees and asylum seekers. Those are beset by difficulties. They involve a certain amount of stigma. It restricts choice about where people can actually spend their money. And it certainly doesn't seem to us to accord to the broad principle of dignity and respect, which is articulated right at the outset of the bill. So for all of those reasons, we think that th that specification uh, that there ought to be a requirement that a recipient should uh, articulate a desire for non-cash payment first before that form of payment is then, or form of assistance is provided, uh, should be there. On the broader issues of winter fuel, uh, we haven't touched on the eligibility issue, but we have in our evidence tried to make, I, I think, a, a powerful case for why the current system works well. And although it is perfectly reasonable for people to think that there may be an opportunity to save some money through targeting, every attempt to try and do so uh, could well actually, firstly, it will increase the administrative cost for the agency uh, because you have to implement whatever uh, restriction you put in place, whether it's a means test or something else. Um, and it also means that whenever you place a barrier in the way of people accessing an entitlement, it tends to be the people who are most articulate and most assertive who are able to negotiate that hurdle. And that tends not to be, in the main, the people who are in the greatest need. Um, so we are, we would, we're very pleased to see that the commitments that uh, different politicians and parties have already made to the principle of 
winter fuel remaining a universal uh, benefit remains. We just want to put it on the record that we are uh, strongly supportive of that position and grateful that that seems to be uh, supported. However, there is still a provision in the winter heating assistance provisions in the schedule to the bill that allows it to be restricted on uh, in terms of the finances of the individual. Given the commitments that various different parties have made to it and the fact that uh, you know, the winter fuel uh, being a universal basis, that was potentially going to be re-examined during the UK general election. But following the results of the UK general election, that seems nearly less likely to have happened. If it is the case that there is a robust political consensus in Scotland around maintaining winter fuel, that's uh, great. But we therefore would like to see the bill reflect that um, more, more directly. Ruth Maguire wanted to come in and just a, a sub, which I hope won't be too controversial, given what Derek Young's just said. <laughs> Susanna, I was interested in you saying that there are other um, folk within our, our communities who, who would potentially benefit from a winter fuel payment. And I just, uh, uh, you've, Derek's made himself <laughs> quite clear there, but I want to hear everyone else's reflection on whether there might be value in, rather than giving a blanket payment to everyone of a certain age, using some of it to target at, at other people in need? Mm. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, that what, what, going back to a previous question where we talked about um, underlying entitlements and, and, and passports, one way of looking at it may be to look at people in receipt of disability-related benefits if we were talking about extending winter fuel payment a system and actually using that to, um, a, a, as a way of targeting um, winter fuel assistance to, to people. But that is not to cut across the, the um, existing provision. It's extending it to um, another group. Yeah. Did you in that particular one? Um, I, I think if you look at the eligibility for cold weather payments, the £25 a week, there is a list of, group of people there who are seen as vulnerable and in need of additional uh, heating support. And it may be possible to extend... I mean, I, I'm not going against what Derek said in terms of the universality here, but if you have a group who by virtue of age are, are universally accepted for winter fuel payment, you may have a secondary group by virtue of need um, who would be eligible, but that wouldn't be necessarily um, a, a universal. So we've got the universality, which I, I don't think MD is arguing to say to take away, but it could be supplemented by the list of groups who um, are eligible for cold weather uh, payments. Mm -hmm. You wanted to come in. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. It, it was just for completeness, I mean, given the uh, high level of importance of the fuel poverty issue and the whole question of energy, and in your submission under the winter heating assistance, um, you mentioned specifically that there are some possibilities here, for example, around securing discounts from energy suppliers. I just wondered if you could speak to um, how you think that could be done. Look at Scotland, um, it, it's very neatly split in two um, for the distribution of electricity. There is a district network operator, as they're called, that operates in the north of Scotland, and by that we mean sort of Perth upwards, and there's a district network operator that operates in the south of Scotland. The distribution and network charges in the north of Scotland mean that consumers pay a higher unit rate in, in the north. That's round about £70 a year more um, if, if you have a like-for-like like, uh, home, um, simply because of the additional uh, network costs. Um, that places those uh, consumers immediately at an unfair advantage that they are paying a higher cost. Um, if you think of something like the cold weather credits um, that is given just you know simply as the £25, that £25 will buy you a bit more in the south of Scotland than it will in the north of Scotland. So the, the, the opportunity for something like winter fuel payments or indeed cold weather payments, um, you could adjust um, by virtue of where the, the occupant stays. And that there are very clear and defined boundaries that are, that are in place there. 
Um, so you, you could do that by that postcode area. Could I just come uh, very briefly in on the fuel poverty uh, issue, Convener, um, which is that uh, 16 years ago now, this Parliament articulated a desire to abolish fuel poverty within a 15-year timescale uh, in, in a piece of housing legislation. And that seemed a realistic ambition at the time, but um, it was not met by 2016. Uh, so we're going to re-articulate uh, a new desire, a new strategy to tackle fuel poverty. Um, and even for the last few years of its operation, we weren't even actually declining in the rates of fuel poverty, it was increasing. Um, there, there is a good amount of evidence that um, winter fuel assistance or payments as they currently are, puts money directly in the hands of the, the age group who are most at risk of age-related illness and deaths. Every year there are a fairly grim set of statistics of excess winter deaths that are published. And these point to the fact that these are beyond what you would even see on a seasonal basis because of cold-related um, illness, how people are affected by it. Um, so it's, it's an extremely valuable form of assistance which, which does work. There's a lot of evidence also that people do spend their winter fuel payments on, on, on fuel costs. And fuel costs is the, the single greatest element of household <coughs> spend which has proportionately increased over the last decade. So it, it is, well, certainly we feel it's not... That, Although there is a perfectly legitimate and understandable uh, thought process to say that there might be some more efficiency available here, the current model works well, and to change the model, certainly without consulting widely on the people who'd be most directly affected, would, I think, be um, wrong and, and also politically difficult. Thank you for that, Derek. Jeremy Balfour, want to uh, Thank you, Convener, and good morning to everybody. I suppose, just to start, just to declare again, but I'm in receipt of a higher rate of PIP. Uh, can I start with Derek, but others do jump in. Um, in regard to two, two issues, um, we, we don't know yet what the government's thinking is in regard around attendance allowance and whether that would just simply be brought over from the present system. Um, my impression is, it, is that it is harder to get attendance allowance than it is perhaps to get some kind of PIP. And do you think there needs to be a re-looking at attendance allowance and the criteria for that? The other issue is, obviously, if you're over 65, you're never entitled to mobility. However, immobile you are. And with an ageing population, again, within financial restraints, is this something that you would be looking to change, that perhaps that age limit should be raised to, to an, a higher limit, and is there a discriminatory issue around um, a challenge that if you are 64, you can get it? And if you're 64, you get it for life. But if you're 65, you never get it. And is that an issue? And finally, um, is uh, around how much of this would you like to see on the face of the bill? And how much are you content to have within regulations and secondary legislation um, at a later date? Who wishes to start off on that one first? Derek, you look keen on your <laughs> Well, it, 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 was, it was directed to me, at least in part, so that's uh, perhaps appropriate. Um, I, I mean, I'm very grateful for the, the question Mr Balfour has asked. It touches very directly on what, for us, is the principal issue which can be tackled during this Bill's parliamentary passage, albeit that it isn't answered in the Bill itself because it's one of those issues which is going to be left but to regulation. Um, if, I, if I could, with your permission, answer the second question question first, because in a sense that's much more clean and straightforward. Um, yes, we are strongly supportive of the idea that the present system is indefensible in terms of the effect that it has on people of different ages, mm -hmm. and not in terms of the age they are now, but the age at which they are able to qualify for disability-related support. Um, the, the, as, as Mr Balfour has explained, the fact that it, if you are over the age of 65, when you first establish you have a disability, which would entitle you to financial support, the question is never even asked whether your mobility needs are such that you would deserve a higher level of support, because that level of support is simply not available. It doesn't matter if you would meet exactly the same test as you would have a week or a month or a year before, um, it's, it's simply not available. Uh, we do consider that to be a form of discrimination. Uh, and indeed, the Equalities and Human Rights Commission seems to agree with us. Um, they have pointed to the fact that there is a difficulty around the public sector equality duty if the Scottish Government goes through this process of reviewing 
the eligibility and doesn't tackle what seems to be a very clear case. There are other recent examples that have gone to litigation. There was a case involving a student awards agency, for example, where that uh, it was ruled to be uh, illegal and something that had to be addressed. Um, it, it, it makes us, it's a substantial amount of money. In the higher rate, which is about £57 a week, it can mean well over £3,000 a year difference to someone purely, again, on the basis of their age, not on the basis of their condition or its impacts. Um, so it's something we would very much like to see uh, the government tackle and the parliament uh, continue to have a very strong focus on. We acknowledge that there will be, if there would be substantial financial effects simply to abolish uh, effectively, or to extend the mobility component availability to all attendance allowance recipients. Um, we did some uh, analysis that suggests we're talking hundreds of millions of pounds. Um, but it's actually, because the question isn't asked, we don't have very reliable bits of data. Um, so the, in some respects, the cleanest and most satisfactory approach might be to abolish the distinction between attendance allowance and the working age disability benefits altogether. Again, it's not clear from the bill because of the nature of the bill whether that's something the Scottish Government is currently con contemplating. Um, we, th th that would allow the possibility, for example, then to think about uh, how paying for care needs as well as paying for the additional costs of living with a disability might be uh, treated in a more coherent and, and holistic way. Um, we haven't articulated a very specific costed out proposal uh, about how that could be done within current funds, but certainly the most important element for us is that the age discriminatory element should uh, go, you know, should, should cease. The age should cease to be a factor in the quality of financial support that you get based on disability. Uh, and if that's something that the committee can keep a focus on and the government responds to, we would be uh, delighted. Can I ask you, Derek, have you... Um met with the ministers or officials and raised that with them? Yes, uh, we have. Uh, I, I met with uh, the minister and the lead official on the bill uh, two or three weeks ago. Uh, it was a very positive meeting. Obviously, the minister herself will be appearing later, I think, before your committee, so she can probably... It's probably best that she reports on the outcome <laughs> of that meeting than I do. Okay, well, but yes. I, mean, I must say, the Scottish Government is aware of this right. issue. And they have been very responsive in acknowledging the fact that this is, you know, a difficulty, particularly the fact, the fact that there is a legal problem on a discrimination basis changes the nature of the conversation we are having about, wh firstly, whether it can be resolved and on what timescale it might be resolved. We understand that, you know, the, the, the immediate focus is clearly going to be on areas where there has already been a public commitment, whether in a manifesto or a statement in Parliament or whatever, to try and shift the, the way in which the system operates. It is also true that the, by far the most important thing, and we would agree with this, is to make sure there's a seamless transition so that payments made on the day before uh, the transition into the new agency continue to be made. That, that, is, that is vital. And it could well be problematic to that to try and disrupt too much so the eligibility. But we know that there's a, a special expert group led by Professor James McCormick, who I know has given evidence to your committee already, looking at disability and uh, carers in the broader sense. We hope that whether it's on the short term or whether it's on a slightly longer term, but not too longer term, that this fundamental discriminatory problem is resolved in a way that's satisfactory for everyone. Thank, thank you, Derek. Certainly we'll <clears throat> ask the, the question. Uh, Suzanne or Norman, do you want to come in on that particular one? I think really just to, to echo what, what Derek very, very eloquently said, and we do believe it's an artificial um, distinction. Um, yeah, which, which cannot be justified. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, Could I just go slightly back just to the, okay. my very last point in regard to, uh, and um, my colleague Adam Tunkin may come in on this as well, is, is how much you be in a primary legislation, how, how much you be in secondary legislation. I mean, it, clearly you, do, you, you cannot have everything within the primary legislation, but would you want something in regard, if we're going to keep attendance allowance, in regard to the primary legislation, or if the government would move to say everyone, whatever their age, would be entitled to PIP, <coughs> would you want that in the primary legislation? Derek, you come first on that one. You do keep coming to me first, Convener, but well, you, uh, you, you know. No, I just saw I took it you were going to answer. Um, yes, we we th we have uh, put in our written evidence that we think a greater the, a balance in favour of greater provision in legislation would be justified. When you look at many of the cases uh, that happen on the present system, 
some, several of them involve testing whether the regulations meet the statutory definitions and criteria that are set out in primary legislation. So it means that people have a greater level of certainty about what their expectations are because something is articulated in primary legislation. And primary legislation can be used as a basis to challenge whether statutory legislation, secondary legislation is consistent with it or not. Mm -hmm. um, we understand the desire for flexibility that's been articulated, and that's perfectly legitimate. But I think there is, a, there is an, also a need for consistency and certainty. And uh, there is a further point on, and it's been made before, but about parliamentary scrutiny. This is our opportunity as an external organisation to influence the primary legislation process. We do not enjoy a similar opportunity through the affirmative resolution procedure. There isn't the opportunity to put down amendments, for example. And so if the meat and drink or the great substance of what people will enjoy and on what eligibility basis is entirely or for the great majority part in regulation, it limits the ability of this committee to get access to uh, expert evidence and to ask questions in the back and forth way that we have been doing today. So that would be regrettable. I think there would be an advantage in having a, a greater certainty in the bill. Whether it needs to be at the full level that exists under the Westminster model or not, I don't know. I don't know what practical possibilities there might be between those two positions. But a, certainly a greater level of certainty would be something which would not just uh, potentially improve outcomes for people, but also put, uh, improve the process of scrutiny so that the parliament was able to be more sure that it had set up a system that was robust and, and uh, lead to better outcomes. Anyone of the uh, panel wish to come back on that? Or? Just to say again that, that, that we um, agree, and particularly given that we don't know what shape, if any, an external oversight body will, will take. So we do believe that there is a, <coughs> um, a very, very strong case to be made for having more actually in primary legislation, particularly in relation to accountability and scrutiny. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just close the meeting and move into private session. And thank you very much, panel. Thank you.